All right, folks, do not go, do not move. Glue your eyes to the tube. You've got it today right here on Cliff's Notes. The undercover billionaire and the creator, owner, founder of Stearns Lending, one of the largest mortgage companies in history, is here with us today on Cliff's Notes. Let's go! Real estate agents, are you struggling with the day-to-day -day grind, dialing for dollars, putting in hours of floor time with little to show for it? Are you looking for tips, tricks, and tactics to accelerate your career as an agent that will have you closing more homes, working with more clients, and earning more money than ever before? Hi, my name's Cliff Freeman, and I've spent the past two decades of my real estate career running one of the top brokerages in DFW and personally coaching over a thousand high-performing real estate professionals across North America. I created this podcast to share the strategies and tactics you need to explode your real estate business. I guarantee it. All right, ladies and gents, the guarantee is on today, I promise. And as you can see, we got quite a crowd here for you. And the reason why is we have a very special guest, a dear friend of ours and uh, new in business with our company and doing some amazing things. None other than the man himself, the undercover billionaire, Mr. Glenn Stearns. Welcome, sir. Well, hi, Cliff. How are you doing? <laughs> I have, man, I'll tell you, I'm on cloud nine right now. It's uh, it's so nice to have you here. And um, I know you came in especially to be on the show today. And then we've got a, a big event uh, coming tomorrow. In fact, uh, you'll be speaking at that event. Um, it, we're going to talk about a, the billionaire mindset uh, tomorrow. And uh, if you're in the audience watching this live, uh, we might still, Rachel, we might still have a ticket or two left. I we think. definitely can have a ticket or two yeah. left. Yep. We squeeze you in. So yep. just chat in the box and I'll get you hooked up. Yeah. If you want to make some comments in the box, we'll see if we can get you squared away. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to cover the, the the billionaire mindset. And we've, we've got a full day from eight o'clock networking and nine o'clock. Stephen Hilgart, uh, one of uh, Tony Robbins, number one, former number one coach for Tony Robbins will be there. And uh, Jason Guessing is coming. Brent, uh, our friend Brent Gove. And then in the afternoon, we've got a wonderful national social media panel where we're going to bring the best of the best for social media for real estate agents. But you're obviously our keynote, and we are super stoked uh, to hear what the billionaire mindset is all about, uh, Glenn. Hey, I'm I'm looking forward to it. You know, I mean, I came down, you know, as I, I think I told you when, when I first got introduced to EXP and that mindset, you know, I was just blown away. And so I've uh, embraced EXP. I've gotten really close with Glenn, and, and I really, really love what you guys are all about and you know, I want to be involved. And so uh, we've created a little partnership and off we go. So. Yeah, well, we're, we're super stoked about that partnership and are invested heavily in, in helping that be a success. And by the way, it is called Success Lending. So mm -hmm. we're, there you go. we're super excited. Uh, Glenn uh, bought Success, the, uh, the company. What a wonderful legacy that, that's been with uh, just a tremendous impact on business leaders for a hundred and I think 34 years or something like that. But what an incredible brand Glenn that Sanford, you get right? to, yeah, Glenn yeah. Sanford, an incredible brand that you get to share and, and uh, uh, you know, do something really, really exciting with. Um, you know, that is, uh, that's something that uh, we're, we're just excited to be a part of for mm -hmm. sure. I mean, it's, it's a first time that I've really been able to see something like this come to fruition, especially with someone like you that's, that's uh, helping uh, lead the, the charge here. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, what, what, what separates EXP, what separates a lot of companies from others is it's not a job, right? This is and what success has been, or at least to me, what it feels like is it's more about personal growth. And so we get to a place with our, you know, careers and we get rolling in it and we realize I want more and we want to have that personal fulfillment. You want to have something. And so it's such a great add on to what you guys already do. And, and uh, it just feels like it fits so perfectly to be able to have that, uh, you know, add it um, really, you know, just kind of cherry on the top of what a career is all about, you know? Right, right. 
and the congruency, the alignment between you know you and and Glenn and the two companies is really special, and that's you know that's something that is is hard. But since we're building it, we can establish early on uh, what the uh, you know what the, the the core values are and and the strategy that you know that that works together really well. And this is a unique situation. Uh, it really is because of our model, and then of course your model and. And uh, you know, I'm just I, I I can't wait to to look back after a year or two here yeah. and see how far we've come. Uh, Glenn, you are uh, you're in the Hall of Fame, or you you will be, uh, probably both in real estate and in in mortgage. Um, I mean, you've accomplished some just incredible things uh, in your life. Uh, most people can't even dream uh, as big as the things that you've done. Um, but I, I know uh, that this has not always been a smooth road mm -hmm. and you've had many lessons along the way. Um, what I'd like to do for the benefit of the audience is kind of, can we just go back a little bit? And, and there were some things obviously that happened to you in your life that were very formative as you were growing up. Can you just talk to us a little bit? I mean, what that that fire? I mean, that the undercover billionaire. That what what you did there was. I mean, everything you do just seems to be over the top. Were you born with that, or is that something that you developed as you were growing up? You know, uh, you know, I grew up in a very humble setting. My my dad was a printer. My mom cleaned homes and was a grocery checker. Uh, we were in a little apartment, and you know, I failed fourth grade, so. You know, didn't get off to a great start. I had uh, dyslexia and whatnot and had a child in the eighth grade. And then, uh, you know, really started kind of patterning myself maybe around a lot of those uh, unhealthy people in my family back then um, with drinking and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, there wasn't a lot of role models early on. And just something happened where people would come out of the blue and just say, you know what, you've got something special, Glenn. And, mm -hmm. and I would always be embarrassed. No, no, you know, but then I would say in the back of my mind, I want to prove them right, you know, and that's why I'm so involved in young people and, and planting seeds in them, because while we might not realize it, there's a little seed that can grow and, and they can also, you know, step out of maybe a situation that they're in. And so anyway, so yeah, I got off to an interesting start, but I was the first in my family to go to college. And after college, I realized, you know, I, I wanted to do something different. So I moved to California. We just got up, my friend and I, and drove across country and sat, uh, literally I was sitting on a bench over the Pacific Ocean looking at the, you know, the beautiful homes and the fast cars and the beautiful people. And I thought, I want this life. And... I walked up to the man in his yard and I said, what did it take to get this? He's in there just kind of, you know, trimming his rose bushes. And I said, I know I can do it. What, you know, what did it take to get this house? And he says, senor, I'm the gardener. <laughs> he's, like, <laughs> he's like, I think the man's in real estate. And I go, I'm going to get into real estate, you know. And, you know, I was young, naive, big eyes. And so I just stayed in California and and decided to give it a whack in real estate, you know? And, um, and I'll tell you, the one thing that has meant all the difference in the world, and I fell into it, was surrounding yourself with role models and good people and mentors. And, you know, and I had not known anyone, and I was pretty, you know, I'm not a shy person. So back in Maryland, I, you know, I knew a lot of, I had a lot of friends, and here I am now in California, and so I started looking at who are the business people, who are the leaders, who are the pillars of the community. And I'd go, hey, you know, you want to go to lunch? You know, I just want to pick their brain. Mm -hmm. And then for whatever reason, I was very lucky to be embraced by that community of, of leaders. And then they just started mentoring me. And I just was a sponge, you know, and just, just did what, you know, whatever I could learn, just osmosis, let it rub off and, and see... And by the way, when I when they were when I say successful people, they weren't just you know wealthy people; they were happy people, right. you know, and uh, and they were well respected in the community, and and that's what I wanted, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't I've never chased money; it was about chasing 
a, a, you know, a way of life, a feeling, a, you know, a, 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 and having respect and, 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 you know, and it all started leading into things like integrity, you know, keeping your word, you know, all these little things that not cutting corners when you realize when you add those up, you can call it karma, you can call it whatever you want, but in the long run, your life works out, right? Because people come at the right times in your life when they know you're a good person, you know? And, and you know that, we all know that. We know when we're hanging with the balcony people, we know when we're hanging with the basement people. Mm -hmm. We know, you know? And so it becomes then a conscious effort, at least it was on my part, as a young kid, again, that was patterned maybe in the wrong, you know, beginnings, but to start clearing out all the basement people, just hanging around right. the right people. Right. You know? So that kind of so, so started. You, you, you said you really didn't have any heroes growing up then. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I didn't have a lot of great role models, you know? I mean, my mother, um, you, know, you know, again, she, you know, little things she would do hey, kids, let's go. You know, I'm like five years old. We're getting in the car. We're going to get lost. We're going to get lost. And, you know, we drive through all these farms and places. She'd pull over. Oh, no, guess what? And my sister, we're lost. <laughs> you know, and those little things like that, while it's silly, it, 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 it taught me not to fear what's around the corner, but to be excited about what's around the corner. You know, and it's, it's little things, right? And we have, you know, change. You know, we become really resistant to change, mm -hmm. yet, man, that's going to be fun. You know, look, I mean, I failed fourth grade, and now I've got friends in fifth and fourth. It's pretty cool. I mean, I had this horrible thing. I got a girl pregnant. No, I have a beautiful daughter. You know, I got lost with my family, and we went and saw the coolest, you know, you know, windmills and, you know, whatever, right? You know, and so it's how you look at it, you know, that old adage that, you know, to put two kids in a room full of horse manure and the one kid's crying and the other kid's digging. What are you doing? There's got to be a pony in here somewhere. You know, it's how you think about life, right? right and right. so, I, I, you know, for whatever reason, uh, you know, I, those early years kind of got me to realize there's probably a lot of ponies in those piles, you know? Right, right. Yeah, there's two ways to look at it. I, you know, the story about the, the twins that grew up with an alcoholic father and mm -hmm. Uh, 30 years later, they caught back up one of them, and one of them never touched liquor, and the other one was was a drunk. And when they asked each one of them why they turned out the way they did, why they didn't drink or why they drank to excess, both of them said, because of my father. So, right. you know, you can look at, uh, it was a Jack Canfield in his great book, Success Principles, says E plus R equals O, which whatever event happens in your life, that reaction to that event gives you the outcome. And you determine the reaction, therefore you determine the outcome. So yeah. you had an epiphany at, when you got to California. I think a lot of people have an epiphany when they get to California. I don't right. know if it's the warm smell of colitas <laughs> rising up in the air or, or what it is, but you know, you got Don Henley and the That's Eagles right. out there. Um, was it, it, and at that age, you were were you out of college then? I, I just graduated. I was about twenty three. 23. Right. What, no job offers out of college? Mm, me? At a 2.1. Yeah, <laughs> maybe to pour beer. That might have been my only job <laughs> offer back okay, then. But you yeah. were pretty good at that? Is yeah, that, yeah? Okay. I was pretty good at that okay. back then. Okay. Um, wow. And, and you just, something inside of you, is there something, you, you mentioned that speaking words into people, planting that seed can be very powerful. And I, you know, I, I really believe in that. And I believe it's because I've coached a lot of people and, and I know that it may be a long time down the road before we see that the benefit of what we said. Was there somebody that poured into you at a younger age that planted those seeds for you? What was it that just compelled you to go out yeah. and, and go take life by the horns? So I'm uh, 14. I'm, uh, I've got a girl pregnant. And... I, we'd hang out at the roller rink. This is back in 1978, not to date myself, but <laughs> okay. And um, so, um, and uh, I was at that roller rink and the manager was uh, someone we all looked up to. And I was in a deep depression because, you know, I'm a young kid and everyone's laughing. Look at this kid. He got, uh, you know, a girl pregnant and it wasn't 
you know, it wasn't a real um, nice time in my life. It was kind of uh, tough. And, and so this man, this manager of the rink, he kind of pulled me into his office and he said, you're going to make it, Glenn. There's something about you that you're really going to make it. And I said, just uh, come on, stop, right? Yeah. But it just stuck with me that this guy that we all looked up to um, thought, you know, there was something that he saw in me. And then when I went to college, I formed a fraternity, of course. And um, so the, the, the vice chancellor from Maryland happened to be um, a founding, or he, was, he came over to help seed the the new chapter that we were starting. And we got to know him and he sat around with all the new people and he says, let's talk about people we admire and why. And he goes, let me start. He goes, you can talk about a president or you can talk about somebody or whoever it is, but why? He goes, I'll start. I admire Glenn. You know, and I was, again, I'm embarrassed, don't, oh, no. But I liked it. You know, I, I didn't know I liked it. I mean, I knew I liked it, but I was embarrassed about it. You know what I mean? And but when I'd walk out of there, I was like, I, I like that feeling. I like, you know, and, and so it, little things like that. And, and I guess I say all this because most people I know, they see something like, wow, you have a jet or you have, you know, this huge home or you, I can never get there. And the answer is, yes, you can. Right. Because, you know, we all it, you don't have to start with a silver spoon. You don't have to have you know, Daddy Warbucks, it's all about, you know, aligning yourself with people and realizing, and, and again, and I didn't have this overwhelming, you know, this confidence, it grows over time, right, and, and that's why I love being around young people and letting them understand, yes, I'm a flawed person, and yes, I started out, you know, and, and, and showing them, I lead with my flaws a lot of times, because, I think, I hope it'll connect with people that think, he's not 2.1, shoot, I'd be better than that, you know, I, maybe I could, you know what I mean, I, and, and that's what I enjoy is watching people blossom and grow, so. So is that, do you carry that through now that you're, you know, you've run an incredibly successful mortgage company, I, what, what was it like to go through an interview with you? Uh, I was always the the... Uh, emotional guy like I want to know about your life I want to see if you look me in in my eyes I want to by the way and when I was done people go didn't they have the most beautiful blue eyes I'm like I didn't even see the color mm. I'm seeing if you're a truth teller I'm seeing if I believe that you are going to stick with it and you have the confidence and that's what I'm looking at I want to see your heart and then I let the other people talk about the loan programs and whether you're a great manager you know like mine is about are you do you have a great heart and are you going to be someone that's going to stick with us and i'm real proud we had people that were with us for 30 years my assistant for 26 i have people that stay and that's important because we're going to go through great times we're going to go through not so great times and we've got to learn to stick together you know and and so i never got involved in the details of the business there's a lot of smarter people that run mortgage companies I just figured out how to get them into the right room together, you know, and they can they can deal with that stuff. I just want to know if you're a good person, and we'll we'll figure the rest out. You're a pretty good people picker. That's that's what I feel. I prize my strong suit. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, life goes full full circle, um, and uh, you know, you very sorry you lost your father recently. Um, we were talking a little bit before the show, and you just said you you really didn't have any heroes. There was a little bit of a disconnect between you and your father growing up, right. but things kind of go full circle. Um, right. would, would you share with the audience? Because to me, it's very touching and, and just such a wonderful thing that happened um, that you really sort of uncovered yeah. uh, recently about your dad. Would you tell yeah. us? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think we all have history with our folks and our families. And in mine, again, when my mom would probably get us in that car, let's go, we're going to get lost, it's probably because my dad was drinking, right? And he had a, a problem with alcohol and drugs and all that growing up. And he was a, um, you know, he, he had his issues as a young person. And so um, my mom left him 1982 and never looked back. And he stopped drinking 
right when she left. However, he remains sort of still sky is gray, you know, just kind of a negative person in his life. And so I didn't think we had a lot in common. We hunted and fished together, but that was about it. And then I got married to my wife, Mindy, and she started inviting him places. And I said, you know, we don't got a lot in common. I mean, you know, but, but I didn't, nothing bad. It was just, wasn't, he's a quiet man. And, and she would invite him. And next thing you know, he kind of started to come around. And so here's this man that had this, you know, he was deeply flawed. And, and as he got older, 1982, he stopped drinking. He went to AA. For 40 years, he was in that program. And in the last probably 15 to 18 years, he saw his value, right? He got this confidence in himself. Here, I didn't even know if he ever went, finished high school, and he's quoting Carl Jung, and he's quoting these things, and he's like well-read. And I thought, who is this man? And so we ended up traveling around the world. I sold my company. We bought a boat and went around the world. I dove with him 44 days in a row. We dive, fish, and then we come back for late lunch every day. And he became my best friend. And this guy had big heart and this quiet person mm -hmm. had found, he had something to offer the world. He had wisdom and he just blossomed. And this transformation in this man. So he died last week of COVID. Um, he had spent three months battling it. And when he passed on, we were there. I mean, I, you know, in a weird way, I mean, I really had a smile on my face to see just the redemption and the, the, what he went through and how he grew as a human being. And mm -hmm. I'm just grateful I got to meet that man, you know, the same man that I think my mom fell in love with 50, 60 years ago, right? Yeah. And um, so it was a wonderful gift to be able to, to, to be around that. Well, that's, that, that's in the DNA, huh? Uh, yeah, he was. Yeah, he did. He's taught me so much. And a lot of times you get taught what not to do and what to do. You know what right, I mean? Right. And uh, but in the end there, again, last 18 years, what a, an amazing human being. Yeah, that's wonderful. What a yeah. wonderful feeling. Yeah. Um, I started the mortgage business with CTX back in 2002 or three, I think. Remember like them? That. Well, you remember those guys? Oh, yeah. Mark Cady and. Uh, yeah. Let's see, who else was the other big, uh, uh, Rodney Anderson was the other big FHA yeah. house here. Um, you uh, you did really good business and until we started to see subprime loans creep into the market uh, mm -hmm. about that time. That was kind of a refi boom. Back mm -hmm. then, rates were dropping from, I think, eight and change down to six, somewhere right. around yeah. in there, if I recall correctly. Yeah, you remember that? Oh, yes. Um, and and well. then we started to develop some systemic problems in the mortgage business at a very high level. Thank you, Anthony Mazzillo. Uh, <laughs> and, and some other, I won't wish any more names. But you always really maintained a very um, good business, right. uh, doing a lot of government loans and, and, uh, just really sticking with the, the good credit. Um, or I say good credit, I'm talking about not, uh, not the, not the Nina, the Penta and the Santa Maria loans, the, you know, no income, no oh, asset yeah. and all that them. stuff. But, uh, even at that, you, can, you, can you still had to endure what was a horrible time in the mortgage business. I mean, I recall it was like seeing, almost like 87, seeing people jump out of windows in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, the mortgage business dropped like a pancake. Uh, and then your your firm went from what you were telling me earlier, what you had a pretty good year in 07? We or? did. So in, we started, we probably did a couple hundred million a month back in, in 06, 05, we were, we were pacing along there. And I was, if you look up on YouTube, there's some videos of 2005 where I'm talking on a, a news show about this is irresponsible lending to have no income, no qualification. You know, you, you just didn't need anything, right? Just breathe and fog you, the mirror. Fog the mirror. <laughs> that was the test, right? That was the yeah. test. Yeah. And then have a 1% option arm. You know, it was a very... Mm -hmm. Negative AM. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. very, very bad for everyone. And these people in that show, they were 
all just beat me up over the fact that I didn't know what I was talking about because there's equity that's going to outpace the loans and and uh, I you know and and I thought it's just irresponsible lending. And so we were trying to not do that much, but you had to do stated income because that was all, there was no mm -hmm. other loans to do. And so when it started to shut down, I remember 06, November 06, I got my first letter. Hey, we noticed in this loan that there are some issues. We'd like you to buy it back. And mm -hmm. I said, here it comes, oh, November my. 06. So we started shutting down our, all that product. And we went, down to we did 19 million from 200 million wow. in September 07 because we had shut all that product off. Most of the other rest of the world didn't right. shut it off, and then they all started falling. You remember New Century? I'm oh sure. gosh, yeah. They fell in yeah. February 07. 327s, all right. those goofy. Yeah. <laughs> so all pain. those guys start falling, and we all, we we went right to the bottom. You know, with basically lack of business, but not. We didn't have a, as many of the buybacks. We had a lot because they were all going bad, but um, but we didn't. So we went from 07 with 19 million. A couple, three years later, we did 26 billion. So you uh -huh. know, we figured out you know how to wow. kind of yeah. ride the rocket ship back up. We were one of the only ones. And I'll tell you a quick version of it. November 07, I opened five offices of failed companies. That, and I said, I want you. I'll never be able to get salespeople like this. Right. 08, which was the worst year ever, we opened five more offices. Be again, because it was talent. And, and I was like, I'm all in. It's either going to work or it's not. And then in 9 and 10, we opened 100 and something more offices. And then just shot. Boy, just that's shot scaling right. super fast. I mean, yeah. we've, we've just seen a company, a public company, do that better Dot com and it kind of worked in reverse for right. them. Um, I guess we probably shouldn't comment on that, but uh, that that seems like um, is that a precursor to what we're about to see in the mortgage business? Are things getting uh, we're to having, the wild west again? Or no, I th well, yes, a little bit, but we're in the middle of a dogfight again right now. And and the reason this time is, you know, you look at two years ago when. You know, you go through the COVID issues and and then the government starts pouring money back in, buying MBSs and mortgage-backed securities and whatnot. And, and now rates are falling fast. So what happens, right? Well, you get so busy, you don't just put up a sign that says we're not taking loans. <coughs> Excuse me. You just up your rate a little bit, slow it down. Well, everybody up their rate and up their rate and up their rate. Right. And it just didn't slow down. So... What ended up happening is you have this huge, you know, supply with all these people that have entered into the business, and a lot of them went public last year, and um, so now they've got to feed this machine, right? And then when it started to slow down, it was about April last year, we went from 450 basis points of margin, which we used to have about 80. That was about average, 80. It went all the way to 450. Wow. And in one month, it went down to 40. They just dropped, dropped, dropped. And so people were able to, were willing to do loans for, for basically less than what it costs to produce them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's been happening for about a year now in the wholesale business. The retail is starting to feel it now. And now you see all these layoffs, thousands of people being laid off everywhere. So it's a, it's a, it's tough again. Yeah. Well, you know? the big driver. Uh, I would say is uh, part of it is the lack of refis. Now the rates are headed up. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know we've got we've got a uh, a log jam in the purchase side of the business with the uh, imbalance of supply and demand. Right. Um, where do you? What's your? How's your crystal ball looking these days? Are you? Uh, you got anything that you could share that you think would be insightful for our audience in the business here? Well. How I felt in 07, I feel again, and but I don't have the answer this time. What I mean is when you're doing bad loans and you're not qualifying people, bad things are going to happen, right? And in this case, when people buy homes and they pay 100000 more than it's worth, it feels like unless appreciation continues to go on that you know maybe that'll pop somehow. I don't know how. 
this time because everyone's qualifying for the loan, right? Mm -hmm. they, they are. And the equity keeps appreciating, which it's done. But there's always cycles. I, I continue to believe in cycles. Um, I just don't know why this one will will burst if it does. But, but you know, it's just I don't think properties are worth what they're worth right now. You know, is do we need to watch Canada and see what they're doing? I mean, they their market has been even more insane than ours. And then they the government just put a moratorium to your moratorium on foreign buyers. Do we need to go look at something like that, or what, what do you think? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. You think about, you know, I was just funny. I was with Dick Cheney a while back, and he was talking about when he did the price freeze. Remember with mm -hmm. Nixon? Sure. Yeah. He was part of that, and he says the crazy things that went on. I hope. I mean, we got inflation coming. That's why they did it last time, out of the world. I, you know. I'm not that that smart to understand how these guys are going to fix it this time. But, uh, you know, when they did pour all that money in, I mean, we I think it um, while it helped, you know, what was going to happen long term with inflation, who knows, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you mentioned earlier rates are one part of the equation in the Fed. They're, now they're trying to clean their balance sheet up and, and sell a lot of their mortgage backed right. securities. Um, that's almost a double whammy. To the economy in terms of taking liquidity out, um, what what do your tea leaves tell you about the likelihood of a recession coming up anytime soon? Yeah, it's. I mean, there's a lot of writing on the wall for that, you know. And and I know when we, it's funny because I was just on a call with our secondary marketing team. We go over um, and forecast and look at where things are and what's happening and look at our competition and whatnot. And and um, you can tell, you know. It looks like they, you know, they they price in a couple of these rate hikes already, and all this, and you know, and and do they really, you know? And then the next one comes, and they keep raising the rates again. You know, you know, are we going to go through another recession? You know, it feels like there's a lot of signs that say it, it it's it's right for that. All right, but okay, you know. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna end all of the doom and gloom here. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna have a little fun now, and I want to talk about your experiences. And Rachel is a, an avid fan of yours. She was watching you on the show before we even got into business yeah. uh, with you, uh, Glenn. And and uh, uh, Travis, do you have a little a little piece you can share with us? I just kind of want to throw this out here to set the mood. Let's see. What Give me a minute. I could see RJ starting to fumble, but I really need him to pull through for us. Let me tell you me to them over there. Let me tell you something. Um, Release the door. Listen, don't get pissed at these guys. Man. No, I know. I'm no, not. No, 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 I hear it in your voice. But don't. Because of two reasons. No, no, this is, this is. I know. Father talking to son. Okay. okay? Yes. <laughs> listen, it won't do us any good, number one. And number two, forget about these guys. But it can, we go farther the other way. We yes. do. Yep. So laugh it yep. off. Who gives a f I This is away. fun. That's why I walked away. But don't even <laughs> pretend to be mad. Who gives a f I wasn't okay. even mad. If like, things go wrong, don't go with them. The ability to remain cool under pressure is what sets apart the pros. All right, that was two f bombs. Did that happen on the show <laughs> after that, or again, or? Well, I was trying to get to RJ's level because uh -huh. he was he was uh, upset at the time. That's the guy with the tattoos on his. Uh, face and trying to get him to snap out of his, um, you know, he wears it literally all over him, his, you know, aggro kind of way. And when he gets upset, he wants the world to know. And so, it's, you know, it's more, I, I really like him a lot because he's got a good heart, but uh, his communication style is a little aggressive you know and i don't think you get very far being aggressive and trying to intimidate people so you reminded me of michael jackson on the beat it video when he was trying to get the bloods and the crips together to make yeah, that yeah. scene that's what i was thinking of <laughs> rachel you i, I know uh, you're yeah. dying you're chewing your arm <laughs> off over here to ask glenn some questions yeah i was i just to tell the backstory i didn't know anything i was watching the show i didn't even know glenn and then uh my son and i started watching the show together and so we got to be really big fans had no idea and then we ended up uh talking business a couple like about a month later so that was pretty exciting and what i found to be really fascinating was the genuineness that you said that you were sharing with the people that you were on the show with 
And so, you know, you're starting this business, you have $100 in your pocket, and you get dropped off in the middle of winter in Erie, Pennsylvania, cool. with a dumpy pickup truck. And he, I found it just really fascinating to see how you were able to really kind of make those relationships. And, you know, kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier is like, you're, you know, really a people picker and you were finding the right people. And I found that really fascinating to go through that process. What was going through your mind as you were, you know, looking for these relationships and, yeah. and trying to network to create that process? Well, to take you backwards quickly, I never looked for a television show, right? I just so happened 15 years earlier, um, a, a production company called me because someone that worked for me said, you ought to talk to my boss and his wife. They would be good on the show. I wasn't looking. We ended up on the show called The Real Gilligan's Island. I ended up winning, you know, and then they kept calling me. Hey, do you want to do another show? And I'm like, I'm a business guy. You know, <laughs> I'm okay. And I said, well, i tell you what I would do. Give me a hundred bucks or drop me off anywhere in this country. I didn't say a hundred bucks, by the yeah. way. I give me, you know, drop me off anywhere with no money, you know, and I bet you I could rebuild again. I bet I could, I could make a business. And um, that's when Discovery you know, called me back and said, if you're real serious, we'd love to do the show. And then they gave me the beat up pickup truck. And then they said, how about you start with a hundred? I go, I thought maybe I could like sell my watch. Maybe have like right. five grand. They're like, no, a hundred dollars. I'm like, do you want to see me live under a bridge or do you want to see me build a business? And they're like, we want to see both. And I'm like, Great. <laughs> so, so I just said, okay. And, um, and to be honest, and I did this, because I had gone through some cancer, and so I'd spent a few years not being the hard charger that I'd been in my life with my family. So here are my kids growing up. They don't see their dad. You're a great example to your son. I wanted my kids to see the real me that got that and us where we were. So um, this was just a wonderful just opportunity to do that. I didn't do it for any other reason. I didn't have any expectation that other people would watch it. I didn't, I'd never thought about any of that, right? I didn't even plan. I got there and all of a sudden I had no idea what to do. I slept in the truck, you know, right. and I went, wow, I haven't thought this thing out very well. You know? <laughs> and it was like 10 degrees or yeah, something. Yeah, it was so cold. <laughs> and so that it was, was painful to watch that. Yeah. My life was like on the fly and, yeah. and I really, enjoyed you know the struggle and the pain and the adversity and trying to figure it out and to your question having 30 something years of building businesses it's all about the people and so I knew I had 90 days and I knew I needed to dive into that community and find people that really were connectors in mm -hmm. the community and then get them to believe in a dream and see if they would march with me up the hill. And so I ended up luckily finding some good people that stuck with me and, and we achieved some pretty um, outrageous things, you know. Yeah, some of the things that you did where you really were turning tires, you flipping tires and iron and all the little stuff you could find out of the Find dump. a buyer first. Right? Find a buyer, yes. And then turning that into a car and then turning that into a house and then turning that into underdog. Right. The so restaurant. it was fascinating. And, you know, what I was kind of wanting you to unpack a little bit is like how you can really share with people how you can start with just almost nothing. I mean, you literally can start with $100 in your pocket. You can work your way up and to not give up on a dream. What kind of message, you know, I assume that's kind of the message that you were going for when you were talking about, you know, you know, I've had conversations about what you were trying to do for your kids and stuff. And, um, you know, what kind of message would you say to somebody? Because there's a lot of people out there that are struggling. You know, we were talking about the recession is coming. You know, how can people continue to adapt and, and grow out of where they're at right now because a lot of people have that really limiting belief, that scarcity mindset. How can you overcome that? You know, it's funny because um, it, I, I thought it would be a lot easier than it was because the real hard part, and this is for people out there in uh, um, America that are struggling every day just to put a food on the mm -hmm. table, that, when I had the $100, that was the hardest part was getting to $200, right? Was because 
it, it's just so difficult to um, come with nothing, right? And so there's so many people that live in that world of just getting enough to pay for their rent and their food and that's it. Mm -hmm. And so, but what I was trying to do is get, again, my kids mostly to realize, hey, there is all around you. You know, you've got Craigslist and you've got eBay and you've got other things. Mm -hmm. You can find, you know, the old saying of one man's trash is another man's treasure, right? And so there's so much abundance that other people will look at and be able to take and you just start somewhere. And but what a lot of us do is we say, yeah, well, that'll never work, you know, whatever, right? Instead of just go do it, you know, and even if it's another hundred dollars, you know, I was the very first break I got came on Pat and St. Patty's Day. And what happened was I thought about I was at a wedding with my five year old son and he's standing around like 10 adults. And I walked up and I'm like, what are you doing, son? He goes, I'm selling rocks. I said, you're selling rocks? He goes, yeah, drunk people will buy anything, Dad. And I thought, oh. I love it. so it's St. Patty's Day. I'm going to go buy a bunch of this trinket things. Oh, I remember that And, episode, and yeah. turn my 100 yeah. well, 50 And I ended up turning into like yeah. almost $1,000 because you could, you know, take a little blinking green St. Patty's Day light that you bought for 25 cents and sell it for four bucks, right? And RJ you know, even sold the shirt off his he back. He sold the shirt <laughs> off his back, exactly. Ran and so, merch. yeah, you learn even through your kids, you know. And But, um, but yeah, it was more about if you hustle, and most people will rather talk about their excuses of why they mm -hmm. can't do it than do it. And I, I believe there's opportunity for everyone. Mm -hmm. It's just, again, it's whether you think you can or you think you can't, you'll be right. You know, and so, you know, I knew my timeline. I heard something the other day, and maybe it was Tony Robbins saying something about if you have, you know, 30 days to clean your house, it'll take 30 days. But if you have three hours to clean your house, you'll get it done in three hours. Right. Well, I had 90 days. I knew my time. It was an advantage to know your timeline, mm -hmm. even though it was a complete disadvantage that you know 90 days is not enough time right but it gave me a wonderful deadline to just hustle hustle work don't give up don't stop and so there's been people all over the world and and i had no idea how many people that show would touch mm -hmm. thousands of people tens of thousands of people have come to me and i, I mean i'm i'm honored that people would find that show something that they would would enjoy more than just entertainment but they've right. taken it going i'm doing my own 90 days right you know and and it's great you know because you give yourself a deadline you can get a lot done and i always say that when i go and I, i'm a part of a lot of philanthropic uh and and different charitable endeavors and they'll say you know yeah last year we raised fifty thousand, and we're hoping we can raise 60. i said why don't you raise two million we can't raise two million well why don't you set your goal at two million mm -hmm. And if you fall way short and you only get to 500,000, you just like 10 Ooh. times your, exactly. you know, you're like, exactly. you know, and it's like set outrageous goals. And even if you don't hit them, boy, you're going to blow by anything that your mind, uh, you know, could think of if you're just modest in your, in your goals, you know? Yeah. Well, and speaking of deadlines, I hate to say, I told you this was going to go fast, but <laughs> yeah. uh, we are in the latter few moments here of the show. I, I just want to cut here for a second. And how do you want to be remembered? How do you want your kids? You, you said you did this, the billionaire, undercover billionaire for that reason, but how do you really want to be remembered? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I want to be remembered as a kind person. I named my company Kind Lending. Um, an honest person with integrity, a happy person. Um, you know, I, I, I hope that... Um, you know, I've done a lot in my life to to lay that groundwork where, you know, I always think about that last moment. I'm laying there, mm -hmm. take my last breath. I just want to be able to smile and said I did it right, you know. And again, it doesn't, in my be biggest earning power years at 50, I went around the world in a boat with my family. I didn't care about, I don't need to make more money. It's not about that. I never, ever took that as a goal. I, you know, it's been a wonderful byproduct, but it's 
more about uh, happiness, connection, and making a difference in the world, you know, and we've, we're out there doing a lot with, with other groups. And I hope that's the, kind of the way to maybe extend your life by being able to do things that last, you know, many generations. And so those kind of things I, I, I hope to be remembered. Well, you, your light, I can tell you, will shine for a long time, my friend. And we're so grateful that, uh, you know, to be in proximity, right? They say that proximity is everything. Mm -hmm. And you reach more lives, though, than you can imagine just doing the things that you do. It's incredible. That show you mentioned. Um, and I know you're not going to quit. There, there will be no deadline for Glenn Stearns. You're going to keep pedaling hard no, until fine. it's just the, somebody else's time. Uh, but we're grateful to have you here. Uh, Glenn, would Thank you, you would you come back maybe and, and give us a, a little, maybe a six month checkup from the neck up and, of course. and uh, you know, have another round with us. We, we've really enjoyed this. I know we were going to run out of time and, and, yeah. uh, but you know, it's so great to have you. We're so excited to, to be working with you and, and just wish you and your family the best. Well, again. thank you for having me, Cliff. I mean, I, I've enjoyed it. You know, I really appreciate this and, and, uh, you know, it's a great platform for people. You know, I know it's a lot about real estate, but real estate's really about a, a lifestyle and about being able to feed your family and do things. So, you know, hopefully. Quality you know, of life. Quality of life. Yes. That's right. So thank you. I'd love to come back. So. Yeah. Awesome. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're a couple of seconds over here. We are so thankful that you're here. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be here. So come catch us next week. I'm going to be in New York. Sorry, you? No? Yeah, I'll I'm, be in Ireland. You're so. going to be in yeah, Ireland. Yeah. We won't be here next week, but yeah. we'll be here in, in two weeks. So come back and check in with us in a couple of weeks. And once again, Glenn Stearns, the undercover billionaire on Cliff's Notes. All right, folks, tune in to Cliff's Notes every Thursday at 1 o'clock Central for the tips, tricks, and tactics to explode your business. I guarantee it. Woo!